Good day to you all, dear ones, and welcome to this 29th day of October. It is day 303 in our journey through the scriptures. Hello to everyone out there. My name's Hunter. I am your brother and your Bible reading coach. I show up with you every day to spend some time together in the pages of the scriptures. And we're going to let the scripture do what it does and point our hearts to the one who is the living word of God. The one alone who has the words of life. And so we come. From all around this world, we arrive here to warm our hearts by the fires of God's love. For our God is a consuming fire, and that fire is the fire of his love. A fire that purifies and restores. A fire that makes all things new. And so today, dear one, we are in the book of Job, chapter 20. Then we go on to Mark's gospel, chapters 3 and 4. And I'm glad you're here. Father, help us to see. Job, chapter 20. Zophar's second response to Job. Then Zophar the Namathite replied, I must reply, because I'm greatly disturbed. I've had to endure your insults, but now my spirit prompts me to reply. Don't you realize that from the beginning of time, ever since people were first placed on earth, the triumph of the wicked has been short-lived, and the joy of the godless has been only temporary? Though the pride of the godless reaches to the heavens and their heads touch the clouds, yet they will vanish forever, thrown away like their own dung. Those who knew them will ask, where are they? They will fade like a dream and not be found. They will vanish like a vision in the night. Those who once saw them will see them no more. Their families will never see them again. Their children will beg from the poor, and they must give back their stolen riches. Though they are young, their bones will lie in the dust. They enjoyed the sweet taste of wickedness, letting it melt under their tongue. They savored it, holding it long in their mouths. But suddenly the food in their bellies turned sour, a poisonous venom in their stomach. They will vomit the wealth they swallowed. God won't let them keep it down. They will suck the poison of the cobra. The viper will kill them. They will never again enjoy the streams of olive oil and rivers of milk and honey. They will give back everything they worked for. Their wealth will bring them no joy. For they oppressed the poor and left them destitute. They foreclosed on their homes. They were always greedy and never satisfied. Nothing remains of all the things they dreamed about. Nothing is left after they finish gorging themselves. Therefore, their prosperity will not endure. In the midst of plenty, they will run into trouble and be overcome by misery. May God give them a belly full of trouble. May God rain down his anger upon them. When they try to escape an iron weapon, a bronze-tipped arrow will pierce them. The arrow is pulled from their back and the arrowhead glistens with blood. The tears of death are upon them. Their treasures will be thrown into the deepest darkness. A wildfire will devour their gods, consuming all they have left. The heavens will reveal their guilt, and the earth will testify against them. The blood will sweep away their house. God's anger will descend on them in torrents. This is the reward that God gives the wicked. It is the inheritance decreed by God. Mark 3. Jesus went into the synagogue again and noticed a man with a deformed hand. Since it was the Sabbath, Jesus' enemies watched him closely. If he healed the man's hand, they planned to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the deformed hand, Come and stand in front of everyone. Then he turned to his critics and asked, Does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath, or is it a day for doing evil? Is this a day to save life or to destroy it? But they couldn't answer him. He looked around at them angrily and was deeply saddened by their hard hearts. Then he said to the man, Hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand, and it was restored. At once the Pharisees went away and met with the supporters of Herod, to plot how to kill Jesus. Jesus went out to a lake with his disciples, and a large crowd followed him. They came from all over Galilee, Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, from east of the Jordan River, and even from as far north as Tyre and Sidon. 
The news about his miracles spread far and wide, and vast numbers of people came to see him. Jesus instructed his disciples to have a boat ready, so the crowd would not crush him. He had healed many people that day, so all the sick people eagerly pushed forward to touch him, and whenever those possessed by evil spirits caught sight of him, the spirits would throw him to the ground in front of him, shrieking, You are the Son of God! But Jesus sternly commanded the spirits not to reveal who he was. Afterward, Jesus went up on a mountain and called out the ones he wanted to go with him, and they came to him. Then he appointed twelve of them and called them his apostles. They were to accompany him, and he would send them out to preach, giving them authority to cast out demons. These are the twelve he chose. Simon, whom he named Peter, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, but Jesus nicknamed them Sons of Thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, Judas Iscariot, who later betrayed him. One time Jesus entered a house and the crowds began to gather again. Soon he and his disciples couldn't even find time to eat. When his family heard what was happening, they tried to take him away. He's out of his mind, they said. But the teachers of religious law who had arrived from Jerusalem said, He is possessed by Satan, the prince of demons. That's where he gets the power to cast out demons. Jesus called them over and responded with an illustration. How can Satan cast out Satan? he asked. A kingdom divided by civil war will collapse. Similarly, a family splintered by feuding will fall apart. And if Satan is divided and fights against himself, how can he stand? He would never survive. Let me illustrate this further. Who is powerful enough to enter the house of a strong man and plunder his goods? Only someone even stronger. Someone who could tie him up and then plunder his house. I tell you the truth. All sin and blasphemy can be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. This is a sin with eternal consequences. He told them this because they were saying... He's possessed by an evil spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him. They stood outside and sent word for him to come out and talk with them. There was a crowd sitting around Jesus, and someone said, Your mother and your brothers are outside asking for you. Jesus replied, Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Then he looked at those around him and said, Look, these are my mother and my brothers. Anyone who does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Mark 4 Once again, Jesus began teaching by the lake shore. A very large crowd soon gathered around him. So he got into a boat. Then he sat in the boat while all the people remained on the shore. He taught them by telling many stories in the form of parables, such as this one. Listen! A farmer went out to plant some seed. As he scattered it across his field, some of the seed fell on a footpath and the birds came and ate it. Other seed fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The seed sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow, but the plant soon wilted under the hot sun, and since it didn't have deep roots, it died. Other seed fell among thorns and grew up and choked out the tender plants so that they produced no grain. Still other seed fell on fertile soil. And they sprouted, grew, and produced a crop that was thirty, sixty, and even a hundred times as much as had been planted. Then he said, Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Later, when Jesus was alone with the twelve disciples and the others who were gathered around, they asked him what the parable meant. He replied, You are permitted to understand the secret of the kingdom of God but I use parables for everything I say to outsiders so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. When they see what I do, they will learn nothing. When they hear what I say, they will not understand. Otherwise, they will turn to me and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, If you can't understand the meaning of this parable, how will you understand all the other parables? The farmer plants seed by taking God's word to others. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message. 
only to have Satan come at once and take it away. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. The seed that fell among the thorns represents others who hear God's word. But all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the worries of this life, the lure of wealth, and the desire for other things, so no fruit is produced. And the seed that fell on good soil represents those who hear and accept God's word and produce a harvest of thirty, sixty, or even a hundred times as much as had been planted. Then Jesus asked them, Would anyone light a lamp and then put it under a basket or under a bed? Of course not. A lamp is placed on a stand where its light will shine. For everything that is hidden will eventually be brought into the open and every secret will be brought to light. Everyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Then he added, Pay close attention to what you hear. The closer you listen, the more understanding you will be given, and you will receive even more. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given. But for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. Jesus also said, The kingdom of God is like a farmer who scatters seed on the ground, night and day while he's asleep or awake. The seed sprouts and grows, though he does not understand how it happens. The earth produces the crops on its own. First a leaf blade pushes through, then the heads of wheat are formed, and finally the grain ripens. And as soon as the grain is ready, the farmer comes and harvests it with his sickle, for the harvest time has come. Jesus said, How can I describe the kingdom of God? What story should I use to illustrate it? It is like a mustard seed planted in the ground. It is the smallest of all seeds. But it becomes the largest of all garden plants. It grows long branches and birds can make their nest in its shade. Jesus used many similar stories and illustrations to teach the people as much as they could understand. In fact, in his public ministry, he never taught without using parables. But afterward, when he was alone with his disciples, he would explain everything to them. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, Let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up, shouting, Teacher, don't you care if we're going to drown? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and waves obey him. And now may the one that the wind and waves obey, may our Lord Jesus now give his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. A leaf blade pushes through. We don't know how it happens, but it happens. The word is planted by a farmer, we're told. The seed of God's word is thrown out into the soil. And whether that farmer sleeps or gets up, that soil, combined with God's word, over time, will create something new. That seemingly dead seed, the result of a dying plant, that's been thrown out into the field, has somehow landed on good soil. And somehow, a leaf blade is about to push through to new life. That which was once dead is about to break forth into life. Jesus tells this story and he says, it's a story that we have to understand if we're going to know anything about him. If we're going to have the secrets about the kingdom and of life revealed to us, he's telling us to pay close attention. The seed must die. If it doesn't die, it will remain alone. It will be nothing more than just a seed and alone. 
But if it dies, it'll produce many others, some 30, some 60, some 100 times. Its life will reproduce and yield a rich harvest. That life, released in death, is resurrected. Jesus wants us to pay close attention because in that leaf blade will come a seed. It will come and be planted on the earth, on Mount Calvary's mountain. There he, this seed of Abraham, will die. And out of his death will come life. Out of his death will come resurrection and a great harvest of lives, men and women, boys and girls, all made new in him. Jesus says elsewhere, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone, but its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. And just a few verses further in that same chapter in the Gospel of John, he says, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. He's referring to his crucifixion here, when he, the seed, dies when he is lifted up on that cross, the result will be everyone being drawn to himself. Again, Jesus wants us to pay close attention to the story of the seed, the soil, and the farmer. He wants us to see the secret of the kingdom that's about to be revealed. So let's pay close attention. Let's follow his example and give our life away now that we have been drawn to him so that we might bear much fruit. That's a prayer that I have for my own soul. That's a prayer that I have for my family, for my wife, my daughters, and my son. And that's a prayer that I have for you. May it be so. And now, let us pray. Lord God Almighty and Everlasting Father, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power, that we might not fall into sin or be overcome by adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Dear Lord, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far and those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold, pour out your Spirit on all flesh, and hasten the coming of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Lord, grant that I might not seek so much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in the giving that we receive, in the pardoning that we are pardoned. It is in the dying that we are born unto eternal life. Amen. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your grateful children, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and all you have made. We bless you for your creation preservation, and all the blessings of this life, and above all, for your immeasurable love and your redemption of the world through our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and the hope of glory. Lord, we pray, give us such awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but with our lives by the giving up of ourselves for your service in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory through all ages. Amen. And now as our Lord has taught us, 
we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Well, hey, hey, my people, my sisters, and my brothers. Congratulations, you've made it through another episode of the Daily Radio Bible Podcast. Another day closer to that goal that you set forth at the beginning of the year to read through the entire Bible. So well done, well done, well done. (laughs) My hope and prayer for all of us, though, as we go through each of these days is that we would be able to see more of who he is. That in the scene, there will be transformation. And in that transformation, there will be acts of love. Self-giving love, like that seed that falls into the soil and produces a bountiful harvest of new life. Yeah, that's what this is all about, my friends. It's not about checking something off and saying, hey, I read through the entire Bible. No. It's about Mr. Love himself. It's about how his love changes everything. So, let's keep at it. Hey, before I let y'all go today, though, I do want to send a shout out to some folks out there to some of our partners out there. These are the folks that make this podcast possible. So a big thank you and a shout out to Craig and Shelby Hildahl, Kayla Brands, Robert Hadula, Shelly Tobias, Patrick Hoffman, Isaiah Jernigan, and Anna Carlson. Blessings to you, my sisters, my brothers, my co-laborers here in this work of the Lord. And if you're listening today and you're thinking, hey, it's getting towards the end of the month and the end of the year, and I have wanted to partner with the DRB, well, let this be a little reminder to that desire that you have had and take that next step. All you have to do is go on over to the webpage, dailyradiobible.com and click on the donate link. You can find that very same link right in the show notes of the podcast. So right from your phone, that can happen. And if you're old school and you prefer to do things through the U.S. Post, you can reach us at Daily Radio Bible 2748 Northeast Molini Way, Hillsboro, Oregon 97124. Well, hey, 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 what do you say we show up again here tomorrow and do it again? That's my plan. Lord willing and the creek don't rise, your brother Hunter plans on being here, here in the northern stretch of the Willamette Valley right outside the town they call Portland I'll be here and you'll be there and together we will do this thing until that time let's go forward in God's joy let's let his joy be our strength and let us always remember this that you are loved and as the young folks say period All right, I'll talk to you again tomorrow. You guys take care.